right, welcome to this Thursday edition of Focal Point, AFR Talk. Ryan Fisher is my name, your congenial, convivial, and amiable, as always, host, Ryan Fisher. Got just a little bit of the dedication ceremony for the George W. Bush Presidential Library today. You know, and I think everybody recognizes he was a good man. I mean, I had my issues with him on public policy. Um, I think we should have gone into Iraq. We should have gone into Afghanistan. We should not have stayed there. So I had disagreements with him on those kind of things. But I don't think there's anybody that was objective that questioned his goodness as a man and his character and his integrity. And and that's beginning to surface. His approval rating has bounced back. He's almost caught up to Obama now. And I think the more time passes, the more his stock is going to rise. And he did keep us safe for seven years. I got a sound that we'll get to here in a little bit. Congressman Tom Cotton from Arkansas getting up on the floor yesterday and saying, look, since President Obama has been in office, we've had five Muslim jihadis that have reached their targets in the United States. Under President Bush, the number was zero over seven years. So his stock is going to rise. He teared up at one point. I think, again, he's just a good man. Whether you had disagreements with him on public policy issues or whatever, I don't think anybody rationally, objectively could argue that he was not a good and decent man a man who was guided by principle. I mean, I will give him that on on my differences with him. I mean, not that m- my opinion matters on this, but the reason I had a difference of point of view with him on Islam is that he had read this book that convinced him that everybody, everybody alive has this hunger for freedom and liberty. And so he said, we want to do that. We want to go into Iraq. We want to go into Afghanistan. We want to give them an opportunity to taste political freedom, political liberty, because they will hunger for it. They'll want it, and they will adopt democracy. And the problem is that he's speaking out of a Christian culture, which has celebrated liberty, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is no spirit of the Lord in Islam. It's about domination. It's about tyranny. It's about totalitarian control. Uh, It's about a complete absence of freedom, a, a total dictatorial control of society by the imams. That's what Islam is about. And he didn't understand that. But he was guided by his principle that everybody on earth hungers for liberty, and he governed and made decisions according to principle. That's why I think he could go into retirement with a conscience that was absolutely clear. He steered according to his lights as best he could. Now, before we get back into some of that stuff, find out today, by the way, that the brothers, the Boston Muslim massacre bombers, were headed to Times Square. The next thing they were going to do is try to blow up Times Square. Remember, Faisal Shahzad missed because his bomb didn't go off. Just incompetence is what saved kids watching The Lion King in Times Square. So these guys were going to go back and apparently finish the job that Faisal Shahzad started. So we'll get into all that as the program develops. Now, my reading has taken me uh, this morning into Ezekiel chapter 16. And uh, this is Ezekiel's prophetic recounting of God's history with Israel, his protection of them after they were born, uh, and his courtship of them, the way he treated them metaphorically as their husband, the way they turned on him in unfaithfulness and adultery, spurned him, and yet his willingness to come and cleanse them again and restore them to their former splendor. You know, And, and so the, the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel, says, look, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and make known to her her abominations. And then he refers to what the Lord did on the day you were born. Again, this is metaphorical. Verse 4, as for your birth, and contrast this to what Kermit Gosnell did. What did he do on the day of birth of these babies in his clinic? He, He severed their heads from their spinal cords. Internal decapitation seen pictures of these babies with holes in the back of their neck where he just went right in there with a pair of scissors, snipped the spinal cord to ensure that these newborn babies would die. This is infanticide. It's murder. It's grotesque. It's uh, Nazi-esque. So that's what he did on the day these babies were born. One of them born into a toilet, flailing around there, trying to swim, according to the witness, like was trying to get out, and it pulled it out, snipped its neck, and killed it. But here's what God did on the day of Israel's birth. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out 
on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I spoke life to you on the day of your birth. I made you flourish like a plant of the field, and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. And then as Israel grew up, then the metaphor is he woos her and courts her and marries her. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty. For it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. But here's the problem. You trusted in your beauty and were unfaithful because of your renown. And you lavished your unfaithfulness on any passerby. Your beauty became his. And then he goes through the things that they had done to bring about his wrath and his judgment. One of them is this. You took your sons and your daughters, whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. You slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire. And he says in verse 22, this is a powerful statement, you did not remember the days of your youth. That's a powerful, powerful statement. You did not remember the days of your youth. In other words, he says to Israel the same thing he's saying to America. If you have forgotten who you were, and so you do not know who to be, you have forgotten who you were. We have forgotten our history as a people. We've forgotten the values that made us what we became. And because we have forgotten who we were, we do not know who to be today. And that's the powerful lesson that God gives to Ezekiel. Well, let's go to prayer for ourselves and for our nation. Sovereign Lord, we thank you that when no one looked on us with pity or had compassion on us, you said to us in Jesus' name, live. You have made us grow as a people like a plant of the field. You covered us with the garment of your righteousness. We thank you for giving us your solemn oath and entering into a covenant with us. Our renown as a people has gone forth among the nations because of the splendor you have bestowed on us. And for that, we thank you. But we confess that as a people, we have trusted in our splendor instead of in you. We have been unfaithful to you and forgotten the days of our youth as a nation. We have become proud, overfed, and unconcerned. We have lived in prosperous ease and walked in the ways of the nations instead of walking in your ways. We have slaughtered your children through abortion and have become more corrupt than the nations around us. In our shame and disgrace, we acknowledge that we have even made them appear righteous by comparison. We pray that you will purify us, bring to an end our unfaithfulness to you, atone for all that we have done through the blood of Jesus, and no longer be angry with us. Cleanse us from impurity and anoint us with the oil of the Spirit. Amen.